I'm a retired educator of 34 years, as Steve uh, mentioned. I'm enjoying the fruits of my labor now, which means I'm not in a public school anymore. Uh, I, in my background, I was a coach and a teacher for a while, very short time. I got into administration very early. I was only 27 when I first began trying to tell parents how to raise their children. And it, it didn't work very well. Uh, you need to have a, we had, I had a great uh, uh, associate superintendent who, when the district that I retired from, told me that we like to have our administrators with a little gray hair which means you have life experience, which means you can talk with parents about their children. Um, I certainly was not able to at the time. Uh, but as a, um, I was an AP, assistant principal, for 19 years, a long time, uh, changed districts three times trying to find that perfect match. I think I found it. It was a great school to, district to work in. Uh, finished out as a head principal at a middle school and then a head principal at a high school. And after 30 years of school administration, so I had four years as a teacher, 30 as an administrator, I was ready to call it quits. I was done. I was fried, cooked, over the top. But in, in doing that, it, when I retired, um, I began to, to evaluate where I had been, what had transpired, uh, the, the matrix that we were all in. I couldn't figure out why things were working the way they were working. My gosh, you know, we, uh, well, I went through 30 years of, of an of a, uh, e evolution of standardized tests. Uh, we began with TABS, okay, in the 80s, an all good sounding acronym, Texas Assessment of Basic Skills, okay? So we have assessment and basic, basic skills, you know, <laughs> used in the acronym uh, that, you know, they called it that. Uh, and then we had TAS, no, yeah, no, then we had TEAMS, then we had TAS, then we had TAX, and now we have STAR, okay, which is what they are involved with now, which is actually an end of course exam that is treated like a standardized test. And it's going to be the most difficult, absolutely the most difficult test for the kids to master. And they'll have to have that to graduate, of course, like they have had all of them. But they'll have to have the, the STAR a passage of that in order to pass the course that they are taking. It will be an end of course exam that they take along the way. So they'll begin taking that, they gradually uh, implement it. It started in the ninth grade this year, then it will go to 10th, 11th, and then finally 12th, worked in a year at a time. That's what uh, they were dealing with now. When I was immersed in it, all I saw was the fact that we had to make AYP. That's what we had to do. Uh, adequate yearly progress, very important term, uh, federal government mandate that you had to fit into a, 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 uh, a formula that was based upon matri matriculating through the system at the appropriate pace, which took into account dropout rate, which took into account what the kids made on their standardized test, which t took into account their attendance in school. If your AYP did not come up to snuff, then you entered into an at-risk school. That's what determined it. If you f fell into that category for two years in a row, then you began being monitored by the state. And in Texas, it's the Texas Education Agency. And every state has got their own word that they use for that. But as a principal, I was very fortunate in that I never had to worry about making AYP or being uh, acceptable on the test because we lived in a predominantly affluent attendance zone. But that was only at my school where that pertained, although there were other schools like that. Within the, the district that I worked in, there were many uh, schools that were Title I, and Title I meaning that they had a high degree of poverty at their school, and I saw the weight of having to make AYP on their, on their shoulders every year. Uh, and some of them, as I began to uh, approach retirement and in my last year of work, uh, they were, had already been uh, taken on by TEA and were being monitored, which meant that they were not making AYP. The, um, the weight of that and the fact that they were, they were consumed by that dictated their daily work. They had to talk about tutoring programs for the children. 
Uh, they had to talk about mentoring. They had to, had to work on workshops for the teachers, lots of professional development, after school programs that would, would take care of, of, uh, of, of more tutoring and, and um, essentially also daycare because so many of the, the parents, both of them worked, of course, and didn't get home until late. But what that did, that, that completely consumed them into making AYP. That's all, that, that's all that mattered. Nothing else mattered because you have to understand how, how it works. And there's another part of this that, that uh, goes along with it, and that's the Texas accountability system, you know, that word accountability that keeps coming up over and over again by everyone. Texas played a little game, and they probably have played it in your state too, but they labeled schools according to how the kids did overall on the standardized test. And when it was back in, they didn't begin doing this until TOS came out. Okay, we've gone through tabs, we've gone through teams, and now we're in TOS. Well, in TOS, it, it wasn't that difficult of a test. And so many schools were becoming exemplary. That was the top rating, exemplary. We're proud of that. Okay, and those that weren't exemplary and that were Title I were recognized. And so you put that on the outside of your building. You go, you'd be driving down the road and you come across the school and it, we are a Texas exemplary school and then they put the date underneath it. Or we are a Texas recognized school and they put the date underneath it. Nobody put that we are an acceptable Texas school or that we are an unacceptable Texas school. <laughs> So you can imagine the, the mind games that that begins to play with people. People in the neighborhood that looked at their neighborhood school without a label on it, they knew why it didn't have a label on it. It was a low performing school. The, what was not going off in their head was, why was it low performing? It was low performing only because it didn't meet that standard that was dictated had to be met. It may have been serving the needs of the kids for generations, but because now there is a standard that has to be met, now we're failing. Yeah. Well, I retired and I got to step back and I got to look at everything. Holy cow. And things were happen happening geopolitically in the world that caused me to question things, and I began searching, you know, just like you. I wanted to know the truth. Give me the truth. I want to know it. I can handle it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And I, you go on and on and on, and, you know, I would listen to podcasts. I would hear, listen to, uh, uh, hear, uh, read articles in the, on the web, and guess who I found? I found Charlotte. And Charlotte began to connect my dots for me. It began to make sense. OBE, what, I, what we had been entrenched in, Bloom, uh, Skinner, all of, the, all of the, the gurus of education that, that uh, we thought could not be challenged. We now begin to understand what the plan was. It took me a while to figure that out because you are entrenched in it. There are barriers that have to be broken. And they're not easy to break uh, because our paradigms are there for a reason. We feel comfortable in them, right? We feel comfortable in the paradigm that we're in. And so to shift to another paradigm is very difficult to do. And, and, it, and at my age of late 50s, early 60s, it is almost impossible to do. Very rarely it's done. And so it took some special things to get me to come off, off of my uh, Republican Fox News uh, perch. But I, I did, and I began looking in other places. <laughs> well, well, Charlotte's work took me to, to Norman Dodd, and I began to see the global picture involved. And I watched uh, G. Edward Griffin's wonderful interview with Norman Dodd, learned so much, got, got Ed Griffin's book, began to learn about the Fed, the money system, and then things began to to fall into place. And uh, it, it, is, it is very um, uh, enlightening, but also um, 
you know, you realize that things were not as you've been told on the evening news. Imagine that. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Um, but uh, what I want to talk with you about today uh, is a little bit about what is going on in Texas right now and some personal experience because as fate would have it, our son, our oldest son, who was doing some missionary work in Honduras, gave up his a great job to go do that, and, and uh, you know, it was it, quite concerning to us, but, but he felt led to do it, and, and we're glad that he did. Uh, he, he grew up a lot, he, he learned a lot, and he helped a lot of kids in the meantime. But he, he, he left teaching to do that. Well, he came, comes back, and of course every kid, and I call him a kid, he's not a kid, every young adult wants to live in Austin, if you're in Texas, okay? Austin is it. Austin is where everything's happening. So he wanted to move to Austin, couldn't blame. He's an Aggie, though, you know, but he's, he's more of a free thinker, and uh, he wanted to move to Austin. And I said, Bobby, you know, he, I said, good luck finding a job, middle of the year. Um, this is when all the teaching cuts have been made, and it was going to look tough to do. But he applied to Austin ISD, had a couple of interviews over the Christmas vacation, and had two job offers. Uh, one of the advantages that he has is that he is fluent in Spanish. Got a job on the east side of Austin, very poor Hispanic neighborhood, uh, working in the lowest performing high school in Austin. Well, little did he know that it was already in the works to be taken over by a charter school company, by an EMO, an education management organization. That's what uh, th those are the management teams that go in the business end of it that goes in to completely run a school. You think about all that has to be done. Custodial work, transportation, maintenance, not just curriculum and instruction, administration. All these things are done by the EMO in a charter school. Austin has hired an EMO called IDEA. It's not an acronym. That's the name, IDEA. I thought it was an acronym. I was, you know, find out what IDEA means. You know, it's got to be an acronym. Everything's an acronym. It wasn't. Uh, it's just IDEA. But they're a for-profit company. Austin ISD has contracted with them, and they are the takeover arm that comes in and takes over the individual school. And what they like to do is they like to take them as a block They'll take the elementary and the middle and the high school and they'll turn the whole community into a charter school community. And so the parents lose their neighborhood school that they've had forever. I mean, the, uh, some of those Austin ISDs, uh, east side schools go back uh, into the 20s, to the teens probably. I mean, when, when Austin first started, uh, you've got to figure that, that that area just east of I-35 was a predominantly uh, run area. I mean, it was a, a thriving part of the Austin community. So it's been there forever. And those schools have been there forever, educating the kids adequately until they were told what the standards were going to be. Okay? Well, apparently the school that, that my son took a job at was already at its fifth year. And let me explain the importance of the fifth year of not meeting AYP. This is kind of, this is the nuts and bolts of, of how, the, how the system works to take you over. After the second year, of, first year of not making AYP, you're kind of on a watch list. Second year of not making AYP, then the Texas Education Agency, or whatever your state education agency is, and how it's set up, comes in to begin making a plan and you have to be involved in a plan for change. How are you going to correct this? Third year of not making it means that the faculty begins to be replaced. Teachers are let go who have, who have not performed up to the level to where their kids pass the test on a large percentage. So their, their evaluation is based upon, and I'm going to read something that, that Steve have, has given me that it's very apropos to this, that guarantees that teachers will teach to the test. It guarantees it. I'm going to read that in just a minute. After the fifth year, 
For the third year, the teachers begin getting replaced who are not cutting the mustard. Fourth year goes by, fifth year goes by, you still haven't made AYP, that's it. Curtain goes down. And so they, the whole elementary, middle, and high school in, my, in our son's uh, area is now being taken over. They've already done the elementary. Next year, this coming school year, will be the middle school. And after this school is over with, he'll have to resign. He'll have to turn in his resignation, as will every other teacher that teaches at that school. And, and they all know it. A lot of them have, have, have left already, knowing the handwriting's on the wall. And then the EMO idea will replace them. And typically, they go to the Teach for America program to bring in the teachers. Well, you probably can do a better job of that than I can, and, and after we're done, you can. But the Teach for America program is a federally funded uh, program to, uh, to go out and get teachers from industry uh, to come in and teach. And they don't have the teacher training that we do, that educators do. And, and uh, it's not like an alternative certification, but it's a little bit more in keeping with that, uh, not exactly like it. So the Teach for America kids are typically brought in and, and I don't want to speak for the program, but they're, they're not, they're not um, real good in classroom management, from what I've heard. And uh, oftentimes, they don't stay very long. So you have a constant turnover of teachers, instability within the faculty. Um, in any event, I wanted to uh, reiterate, I've gotten off of my track on my notes a little bit, but I wanted to just go back and re refresh your memory and, and uh, remind you that the only thing that is causing these students to be relocated and sent to other schools is because their school has been deemed a failure. That's very important. The standards that have been put out there for them to follow, for them to, to meet up to, they have not, and so therefore, they are a failure. And they're a failure in the eyes of the state, and so then that transfers down to, to the community. And, and it all revolves around taking the test. It all revolves around passing the test. And that goes for every kid in, in, across the country. Um, we, we've seen this happen with kids over and over again. They pass everything in school but they have a problem with one portion of the test, and they can't get it done. My wife is a high school counselor, as I mentioned, and Connie uh, ran into a, a child that she had taught years ago when she was teaching biology, and he did not pass the math portion of the test. It was, ta it was tax at the time, T-A-K-S. And she urged him, come back, come back, take it again. Get your high school diploma. And he said, Ms. Huff, this, I passed all my classes. The state of Texas considers me a failure. I'm not going to go back just because I couldn't pass the math portion of the test. And so they consider him not just a failure, but they label him a dropout. And on the books, he's labeled a dropout. And so who else gets penalized? The school. Right, because the dropout rate has to be in line with AYP. So you see the insidious nature of the, of the whole plan. Let me, uh, in order to ensure, I want to read a couple of things, but in order to ensure that teachers toe the line, these wonderful teachers that Charlotte talks about that have been fighting the system and, and not wanting to be uh, conformed to the standard curriculum. There's one surefire way to get them to do it, and that's through their evaluation. If you can get a teacher that, that is being resistant to understand that their evaluation is tied into the percentage of kids that, that, that pass that test, then they know that their job is on the line, and if their job's on their line, guess what is on the line? Their retirement. And if you're in the business for 20, 25 years, you don't want anything getting in the way of meeting your retirement quota. You know, in Texas, it's 80 years plus service, 80. You know, and, and you get to 
you get to be freed. But if you, if you don't get there, then you don't get the perks that go along with retirement. It's a great package. I mean, the Texas retirement system is really good. And well, here, here, here's the quote. For what are teachers to be held responsible for? We're talking about accountability and responsibility. For what are teachers to be held responsible or accountable, and to whom? The lack of clear consensus on the basic skills that should be possessed by the teacher may lead to a demand that he be held accountable for certain student learning outcomes. Outcomes. In this case, the teacher will compare disadvantageously with example, the doctor who is held accountable for prescribing properly for not for whether the patient is cured or not, to hold the teacher accountable not only for what he does, but also for what the students learn is to deny certain humanistic assumptions about the freedom of people, in this case students, to respond as they will to others' inputs. The teacher giving the input, okay? This is the, the opposite of outcome-based. Input-based is what we hold dear is what a true education is all about. Yes. Teacher input. Okay. So making the teacher accountable for precise student learnings may merely serve to increase the dependency of the student on the teacher. Therefore, if, if we are to hold the teacher's feet to the fire and accountability, which we all like, everybody keeps harping on the word accountability, teachers have to be accountable, and we hear constantly on the news of the latest teacher who had sex with their, their student, that, that pulls down the respectability of the profession even more. We never fail to hear that brought up. If we're going to make teachers accountable, this is how we're going to do it. Accountable to what? Accountable to the standards of instruction that will give them the results, OBE, on the test. See the difference? Yes. Back in the day, when we did get a good education, it was input-based, and as things begin to change, it becomes performance-based, outcome-based. And you got to get that, those words in your head for it to really, really ring true with you. A couple of things, more things about the, the, the uh, charter school that's going in that my son is, is look, working at. Um, they're not going to have a library. They boxed up the books. No library. Because what is the tool for instruction? Computer. The computer. Okay. Parents, you know how parents love to go eat lunch with their kids? Yeah. Can't go eat lunch. Parents are shut out. School knows best. So they'll, they'll do away with the lunch, kids being able to eat lunch. I mean, parents being able to go up and eat lunch because they don't want anybody in there. The last thing that I want to mention to you is, is that um, right now we have the two, 2014 mandate approaching. You know what the mandate is. 100%, thank you, George W., 100% of the kids will be proficient by 2014. Insane. Really? I mean, please. When, it, when we heard that for the first time, it was like, What's he, what's he smoking up there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But as we are approaching that date, we're getting further and further behind in schools not meeting AYP. Do you know that nationwide in schools like the one that I was in that had 3,800 students, 2, uh, 215 on the, on the faculty, large schools, 83% of those schools across the nation last year did not make AYP. 83%, now that's large schools, okay? And a smaller percentage of those smaller schools, uh, but in the large schools, which many of your urban yes. schools are, and they have all hit the wall. HISD, Houston Independent School District, is at the wall on, on not meeting AYP. The entire district, not just the school, but the entire district. Okay, so you're finding that in all of your major metropolitan areas. They're all failing. Because why? 
Well, every school is going to fail if you have 100% as the bar. But they're failing because as each test has come along in Texas, tabs, teams, toss, tax, star, okay, as each one has come along, it's gotten more difficult. Well, we've got to make it more difficult. Those kids have got to be able to compete internationally. Well, as it's gotten more difficult, more and more are failing. And how are we doing internationally? <laughs> well, but, but the statistics show that we're where we used to be on top. Now we're somewhere in the middle or close to the bottom. So why are we remaining with a program that continues to fail? No child left behind is a dismal failure. But why do they keep it? President Obama's got his own initiative. He's got RTTT. Somebody's going to speak to that later on. Uh, we've got the carrot that now is being dangled by Secretary Duncan that if you adopt our plan for school renovation, we'll get you out of that 2014 deadline. That's a big carrot. And, and, and we've got like 14 states already approved to, to take that carrot. And we've got about 10 on the books because they have to evaluate your plan to make sure it, it's up to what, they, what the standards that they want to have. But he's not getting away from no child left behind. He's not getting away from accountability. He's not getting away from AYP. He's just dangling a carrot that they're going to have to take. Governor Perry in Texas, the, the oops candidate, <laughs> Governor, <laughs> Governor Perry has not taken that carrot yet. But he's going to have to eventually. Every school district, every state is going to have to take that carrot because nobody can be 100%. You know, it's not going to happen. We know that's not going to happen. No child left behind is a great uh, term, but it's really an Orwellian term, isn't it? Uh, in that no child left behind means many will be left behind. In order for Texas to be able to offer vouchers, this is very interesting. Uh, the way the Texas laws are written, and I was unaware of this until just a short time ago, Texas cannot offer vouchers to the public. They want them. It was on the ballot as, the, as an initiative in the last, in the Texas primary, passed overwhelmingly. Parents are dying for, 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 for vouchers. Well, why are they dying for them? Because the public schools are failing. They're horrible. You know, if you're inner city, my gosh, you want a voucher. And now it's getting into the suburbs. The school where my wife is is a tremendous, uh, very good suburban school. They're, they didn't make AYP. They may not make it again. The school that I worked at, which was considered to be by many a, the closest thing you could get to a college prep school. It was a wonderful academic program. The, the Indians and the Pakistanis and the, and the Chinese were, I mean, the, everybody was moving there, buying, buying homes there to go to school there, okay? Wow. Last year, first year, didn't make AYP. Shows you how difficult it's becoming now to make AYP. Well, everybody will eventually fail if, you know, because what's the standard? 100%. 2014 is out there looming, waiting. President Obama's dangling the carrot. They're going to have to take it. It remains to be seen exactly what that means. Kind of vague. It's vague. Don't know what that means when you take that carrot. But we'll find out more details as we go along. But te what Texas is doing, this is my last point, what Texas is doing, in order to be able to offer vouchers to the public, which they desperately want, they have to change the taxing structure. Right now, public school districts control the property tax end of that taxing authority. If they can change that and get control of that, the state does not control that now, the local school district does. They can't offer what they don't control. So the, in, the, in the 2013 Texas legislature in the House, in the Senate, I'm sure, property taxes are going to be talked about as an exchange for a new sales tax. So you won't have a property tax on your home, but you'll pay a higher sales tax. Then they will control all the taxes. 
and then they can offer vouchers. That's how it's operating. Now, that could, could spell big trouble for school districts because when you have a property tax that you can depend on, you can plan your budget. I'm not sure how it's going to work when you have a sales tax that is dependent on people going out and buying to, to get that replaced. I'm not sure how that's going to work. But if they can get a sales tax, which will be a 9% across the board sales tax on everything, including property, which would be huge in terms of buying a home, then they can control the taxes and they can offer vouchers. And the public will say, thank you, thank you, government, for doing that for us. Now we can get our education. But as we've learned, once you take one dollar, once that private school takes one dollar, they have to do what the federal government tells them to do. It is a Trojan horse. The frustrating thing for me is that as an educator, you're trying to do the right thing. There are many of us in the, in the system that have a conscience. We, we know right from wrong. We love kids. That's why we get into the profession. We want to do the right thing, but are not able to move the system in the right direction because we're dictated to, and it's so entrenched and so much a part of everything going on in education that you can't do anything but follow the rules because the consequences are too great if you don't. And they will not abandon No Child Left Behind. President Obama will have his, his initiative, and it, whether it's RTTT or, or STEM or, or whatever it is, whatever carrots he's throwing out there, uh, avoiding the 2014 mandate, they will not ab abandon No Child Left Behind. It goes back to 1965. They're not going to abandon it now. Why? Because it's a planned takeover. That's why. And they're not going to deviate from the plan. And they'll give it different names, and they'll give it different initiatives that go along with it, but the basic crux of it is not going to, to leave. And we got in bed with the federal government, as Charlotte has pointed out and others have pointed out, 1965, Educa Elementary, Secondary, and Education Act. Title I came out, did wonderful things for a lot of poor children. Special Education idea, another idea, this is the Individual with Di Disabilities Education Act. Wonderful things for kids with special ed, with, with special needs. Who can deny that all the good that's been done through Title I and an idea? But because you're now addicted to the federal money, you have to do the other things that go along with that. And the constricting of the curriculum, teaching to the test, it's all going on. We know it's going on. We can't do anything about it. And no one dares say no to the money because you have to implement the mandates. The mandates are there. You have to implement. You have to have the money. We've got to keep talking about it. We've got to make people aware. Um, I'm often thought, you know, why did I go down this rabbit hole? But I would much rather be aware of what the agenda is than with my head in the sand thinking that all is well. All is not well. Otherwise, we slip right into Orwell's 1984, don't we? I mean, what a book written in 1948, pretty much laid it out as a fiction, but as reality. And now we're there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bob.